welcome to this presentation on iLearn Reliability. In this presentation, we're going to talk about why reliability improvement programs often fail. Sadly, most reliability improvement programs fail. But what do we mean when we say they fail? They fail because there's too much unplanned and planned downtime. There's poor quality in production, there's poor utilization and availability. There's too much reactive maintenance, too much maintenance based on time or some other uh, interval, too many safety and environmental incidents, poor financial performance and the high stress that goes with that, people are fired and even sometimes the plant is closed. Um, that's a pretty serious failure of a reliability improvement program, but they are all signs that the program failed. Um, let's look at some specific reasons why programs fail. First, senior management support is never achieved. Um, the budget is insufficient, reliability improvement is considered a, a low priority, uh, unreliable practices are tolerated. It's, you know, if you think about safety, senior management you know, when the whole safety culture took place, senior management said, nope, this is the way we operate now. You, you would stop a plant rather than letting someone do something that was unsafe. That's the way it's got to be with, unre with reliability. Um, you've got to make those same sort of changes, you've got to make that same sort of culture change within the plant, and it all comes from senior management support. If there's no culture change, it, it won't happen. But the senior management really drive that culture change. When everyone can look up and see someone who's saying, reliability is important, uh, then people start to change their practices. Um, and, and why don't you get, the, why isn't that support achieved? Because senior management were never involved in the program in the first place. It's all little programs by stealth. We're going to buy some alignment gear, we're going to do some condition monitoring, and senior management don't even know that it's going on sometimes. Uh, senior management don't understand the financial benefits. You know, they might understand cost cutting. We need to cut costs. But in most cases, in fact, in a lot of cases, unless there's really um, a lot of uh, fat to be cut, um, those cost cuts do not save anything in the long term. Um, but when you go to them and say you want to invest some money, they really need to understand the benefits of improved reliability to be able to make those approvals. Um, some programs, in my opinion, had the wrong emphasis. So too much time is focused on buying fancy software programs and all the rest of it instead of on the matter at hand which is improving reliability. No software program is going to improve reliability in your plant. It might measure how bad your reliability is. It might assist you to make some improvements but there's a lot more you need to do than buying just some CMMS system or something like that that's going to improve reliability. And Sometimes a lot of people spend a lot of time recording it, recording the downtime and so on, and, and analyzing reliability instead of actually improving it. It's kind of like they're saying, well, the plant is the way it is. We just accept that it is the way it is. So then you take all sorts of measurements and so on to just understand how bad it is so that you can make decisions and look at risk management and so on. Well, hey, that, there's a time and a place but I would argue you need to do much more to improve reliability and then when you measure it, you measure the, the current state, the way it should be. A lot of RCM programs fail because the study of all the failure modes and etc, etc, etc never gets completed at all or it gets completed but the work practices never actually change. Employees don't accept the recommendations, often because they have nothing to do with the development of the, of the process. Uh, why? Because they involve the wrong people. They go about it getting some engineers in a room, perhaps studying it for a very long time and they don't get buy-in from other people. Um, they try to do too much. They analyze every single asset, whether it's critical or not critical or, or, or whatever, and it's, it's a lot of work and um, it, it often fails, as I say. And they try to reinvent the wheel. They try to you know, perform studies on pieces of equipment when the reliability of those sorts of equipment and the failure modes and so on are already well known and already well documented. You don't need to necessarily try to study that yourself. 
and they use inaccurate information. The information they have in databases and you know from uh, failure reports and, and downtime and all of that often isn't very good information. Yet people say, well, it's the only information I've got. That's what I'm going to use in my decisions. Well, sorry, that doesn't necessarily make much sense. Just because you don't have good information doesn't mean you should use bad information. Um, a lot of programs fail because there's too much of a reliance on interval-based maintenance. Now I could just tell a quick story. Someone said recently, oh we went through a big program like that and now we know exactly how many months there is between each maintenance task that we should perform. And I asked about condition monitoring and precision maintenance. Oh no, we'll, we'll get to that. Well, that's not a reliability improvement program. You know, what's happening is healthy equipment is maintained and didn't need that maintenance activity. When I say maintain, repairs and overhauled and bearings replaced and things like that. Intrusive inspections are performed. Unnecessary tasks just in general are performed. Maintenance tasks which take up time and money and so on are performed that never adding value whatsoever. And, and in this process you're actually damaging equipment. You could have a piece of equipment which is running very well, you perform those tasks and the equipment's damaged as a result. Well that's just going backwards. Um, basically unnecessary work is performed and good equipment and parts are scrapped unnecessarily. Very expensive, labour costs and so on. And safety incidents increase. The more time you spend around machines, uh, the more likelihood there is of uh, safety incidents. And why is that? Because the assumptions are that all failures are age related and that's just not the case. We don't have time now to go into that in detail but it's just not the case. Um, they lack belief in condition based maintenance. So even if they have got a bit of a condition monitoring program, people don't believe in it and therefore um, uh, don't use that information. Um, some reliability improvement programs fail because only the condition-based maintenance program is used. Um, so, you know, condition monitoring detects faults that shouldn't exist. Condition monitoring is very important. Condition monitoring can stop failures from occurring, avoid secondary damage, there's lots of benefits. But the way the majority of condition monitoring programs are operated, they don't improve reliability. They just measure how bad it is, really. Condition monitoring technologies are rarely used to improve reliability. Why is that? Because the philosophy of condition-based maintenance is often not properly understood. It basically turns into a reactive maintenance. Rather than a person hearing that there's a bearing problem, they measure it with vibration or thermography you know, shortly before. That's not a great situation. Um, the need to improve reliability is not really appreciated. It's just, it's accepted that that's the way the plant is and condition monitoring just gives you a heads up when the next problem's occurring. And the ability to improve reliability is not understood. Um, and the condition monitoring programs fail. People don't believe in condition monitoring, uh, faults are detected too late or people because people don't have uh, the right sorts of skills and they're not using the technology properly. Uh, programs are designed incorrectly. The wrong equipment's being monitored. Uh, the, the schedule of monitoring is not, is not set correctly. Uh, the settings of the analyzer and the imaging camera and all that sort of stuff aren't set correctly. So a lot of condition monitoring programs fail um, for, well, for all these reasons. And the benefits of condition monitoring uh, are not properly understood, especially by senior management. And what can sometimes happen is you can have a lot of failures, that's bad, pure reactive maintenance. You use condition monitoring and you're still doing a lot of unnecessary repairs because the root causes aren't being addressed. But sometimes senior management can say, hey, you know what, we don't seem to have many failures anymore, so why are we still doing this condition monitoring? And the program fails. Um, Okay, so this one's a little bit more controversial, I suppose. The consultants are paid to come in and improve reliability. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Because the skills and knowledge leave when they leave. I mean, unless you're going to keep those people in the plant forever, 
all that knowledge that they bought with them often doesn't stay in the plant. They come in, they make some improvements, they leave and all those bad habits come, uh, come flooding back because the culture is not improved. There was never any real ownership of the program. Um, In-house initiatives often fail just because there's ineffective internal training. You know, you might get some people to come in and give some training or people within the organization are, are tasked to develop training material. And that's not their specialty. And it, it costs a lot of time and money to do that sort of thing. And hey, there's companies like us that, that already do it. Um, often in-house programs don't have a proper plan. I just say often, doesn't mean yours doesn't. Um, sometimes people can be sort of scared off uh, seeing through a reliability improvement initiative because it seems complicated. And that's because sometimes you attend conferences and people talk about viable analysis and statistics and fancy software and all sorts of things that make it all seem too complicated. It's not that complicated. It really isn't that complicated. I mean, when you get very good with your reliability, there might be some things you'll do that's more complicated. And um, But, you know, to get uh, reliability under controlled, trust me, you can do it. Um, and then there are other issues like there's no equipment list or asset criticality ranking. People are searching for quick fix solutions and spend money just thinking, well, I'll throw some money here, I'll throw some money there without really thinking about whether this is going to work. People get too impatient. They try things for a little while. They don't see it through um, and they, they stop before it's really had a chance to work. Uh, sometimes it lacks focus. It's not a real priority. They're doing other things as well. And well, this reliability improvement initiative is just another thing in the list. And people not willing to make changes to bad practices. So you identify problems, but sometimes it takes some training and some you know, strong will to say, no, we're not doing it that way anymore. This is what, these are the decisions we have to make to improve reliability for the long run. Um, sometimes managers kill the program, even if you have a good program, because they don't understand the benefits. It was never sold properly. Managers weren't informed. So as I described before, managers can just come in and say, you know what, we're spending a lot of money on improving reliability, and maybe they don't perceive that there is a reliability uh, problem. So they save money quote unquote, by killing the program. And, uh, you know, typically they'll leave and get promoted and get transferred or whatever before the ramifications of that, that very poor decision um, uh, are felt by the organization. Because you know, you cut the dollars for a little while, you keep those reliability improvements and then they start to drop off. And, and sure enough, soon enough, you'll be back to where you started. I believe, obviously, that education is the root cause of all of the failures that we've talked about, all the reasons why the programs fail. Um, in a lot of cases, though, conventional training is used to provide the, the training and the education. The trouble is that conventional training, and you've got to understand, we provide a lot of classroom training. We do it differently, though, for a good reason, but we do provide that sort of normal, live, once-off classroom training. But often that training only has a temporary effect. Um, you, you learn a lot over those days. You don't remember everything. But as each hour passes, uh, after that training course, you start to forget what you were told. You need retraining. You need refresher training. You need a good reference. Um, some people are never trained. You know, they, uh, a training course was offered, but uh, sorry, we can only send two people along to the course. Or there's an in-house course, but some people have to run the plant while the course is on, or they were away at the time, or they changed roles and now need training, or they're new employees or whatever. You'll find that there's a lot of people who haven't been trained. Training's not synchronized. That is, you know, this person gets trained and, and a little while later some other people get trained and some other people get trained, but it's all happening with a lot of time in between. So by the time these people have trained, you know, the first people who were trained have sort of started to forget what they were taught and, and so on. You need a lot of training to happen sort of simultaneously so that everyone's coming up to speed at the same time. It can be a real problem also when the training is inconsistent 
when uh, you know, one company uses one set of terminology, another, another. These people believe in one thing, these people believe in something else and that uh, can result in problems. And I hope I'm not boring you right now because the trouble is that some training can be ineffective. It can be boring and even though these movies, I'm just going through bullet points, go in and get a subscription to I Learn Reliability and you'll see how many animations and simulations we use so that our real training isn't isn't boring. Um, sometimes you know, reliability specialists aren't necessarily the most interesting people. Um, you know, death by PowerPoint and all that sort of thing. Anyway, and one last comment. I'm going to offend a few people, but in, in my opinion, there's a lot of what I call Trojan horse training. Now, what does that mean? And I've got this little animation just for this purpose. So you invite consultants to come in and do training. You know, companies that offer consulting services and they say, oh, we offer these great training courses as well. And so they, they come in to your plant. Uh, don't worry, I know we're from a consulting company, but we are here to train you. We're going to teach you and educate you. But, um, you know, just having some fun here. But, you know, these Trojan horse trainers, you know, um, maybe what they're really trying to do is get consulting work because if you don't understand the training, if you don't feel confident after the training of actually doing these things yourself, well, hey, guess what? That expert that came to train you, he can also do the consulting for you. And, and that person will recommend that you need, you know, facilitators and mentors and all sorts of things and they get paid that way. So. Hey, I'm not saying it always happens, I'm not saying everyone does it, but um, I can tell you that it happens. So bottom line is your program does not have to fail. Of course, I'm biased, I think I Learn Reliability is a good solution to all these problems because I Learn Reliability will train everyone. You will have the buy-in that you need, everyone will understand what they can do to improve reliability, how they're affecting reliability, how they'll benefit from reliability. But we have lots of other movies that explain that. If I talked about all the benefits and reasons right now, oh, this movie would just get way too long. So um, yeah, we'll give you the strategy and we'll give you the knowledge and skills to do that. So if you're ready to take the next step, we'd love to talk to you about the subscription um, programs that we have for iLearn Reliability that make it very affordable. Um, uh, if you'd like to take a look yourself and see whether I Learn Reliability is very interesting or effective, we'll give you a trial account and you can see for yourself. Otherwise, um, you know, please email learn at mobiusinstitute.com if you'd like more information or to get one of those trial accounts. Thank you very much for viewing this presentation and taking the time.